Could you, Elizabeth, could you please tell us a little bit about your background or your perspectives? Yes, I'm trained as an evolution biologist, and I've looked pretty deeply into the four billion years of our living Earth and how it evolved, also from a spiritual perspective that brings me to conferences like this. Um, because while I was taught in Western science, which makes certain assumptions about the universe being non-living, meaningless, purposeless, running down by entropy, and life a Darwinian competitive struggle against this tide of entropy washing everything away, which life eventually loses, um, which I came to see as the most depressing creation story that any, any human culture has ever told. And science, of course, gets to tell the creation story in secular societies. So uh, I looked again at how can this evolution work if we do assume that this is a living uh, universe in which the process of the universe is the self-creation of living systems in all their complexity from galaxies down to Earth's uh, living planets that then evolve living ecosystems and societies eventually of beings like ourselves. And in that story, I found a, a maturation cycle that repeats itself over and over, beginning with the first bacteria of Earth. And bacteria had all evolution to themselves for half of those four billion years. For two billion years, only bacteria evolved on the Earth, packaging themselves out of the Earth's crust, inventing all kinds of lifestyles, being feisty and competitive and rather Darwinian uh, for a very long time. They are the only creatures of Earth other than ourselves who created global problems. They created global hunger by eating up all the free food, the sugars and acids that had formed naturally on the surface of the Earth. And when they had eaten those all up, they had to get inventive and harness solar energy to make food. And then, again, making food from solar energy is a process of photosynthesis, and the waste gas from that is oxygen. They were so successful in doing this that the oxygen piled up, uh, absorbed by the seas and earth, and then eventually piling up in the atmosphere, uh, until that caused global toxicity, global pollution. And then, again, they solved that problem by inventing a lifestyle in which you use oxygen to make a living. So it's fascinating to me that in addition to solving global problems that were their own creation, uh, they also invented such technologies as photosynthesis and as nuclear piles to keep themselves warm. They concentrated uranium, and they invented the first electric motors, which are made of 40 different proteins in rotor statters, ball bearings, camshafts, all the parts of motors. And they invented the first World Wide Web by trading DNA freely with each other to uh, develop different kinds of bacteria and different kinds of lifestyles. So what happens after that long period of this very creative and feisty competition and problem solving is that they come to the understanding that it is cheaper to feed your enemies than to kill them. And this is where all species afterwards had to learn this if they wanted to survive, that you have an expansion economy to a certain point, your body did it, it grew to a certain point, and then it has to level off into a period of sustainability. That's what we humans are learning right now. When the bacteria learned that, they formed huge cooperatives of different kinds of bacteria working together each giving some of their DNA to a central library we call the nucleus of the cell. And this cell, which has never had to be reinvented since, is the cells that we are made of. So the nucleated cells, the fruit of cooperation after a long period of competition, become the new entities on the planet. And then they go through another billion years of their own youthful expansion and creativity and diversity before they get the same thing. It's cheaper to feed your enemies than to kill them. And so they develop multi-celled creatures as cooperatives. And of course, we are multi-celled creatures. 
Now, the rest of evolution you learned in school, where you know it starts in the sea and you come out onto land and we get flowering plants and mammals and all of those things, so I don't have to repeat that part of the story. So we can skip now to where humans come into the scene, and humans for about 100,000 years that we've been around learned cooperation at the tribal level after a lot of competition and started to build big urban centers which were the equivalent of the nucleated cell in our social terms. Then those big urban center cooperatives were new on the planet and went about four to 6,000 years when they began forming, went into again the youthful mode of competition. And that's where we are now, is we're reaching the adolescent, uh, the end of the adolescent phase and our globalization process is showing that we have grown our economy to the limits of our planet and we have to become sustainable now. So we have to realize that it's cheaper to feed our enemies than to kill them and stop making war on each other and build our sustainability. Fortunately, we have our bodies as role models. Our bodies are cooperatives of these giant bacterial cooperatives so cooperatives of cooperatives, to the tune of 100 trillion cells, each of which is as complex as a large human city, working in concert with each other and through communion rather than communication, knowing themselves as part of a cooperative. Mm -hmm. And no, no organ in our bodies is exploiting the others or trying to get it to be like itself. I like to say, you know, what if our world economy were done in our bodies? We would uh, call the, the heart-lung system the northern industrial organs. And of course, they have to get raw material blood cells from bone marrow all over the body. So they mine it and it comes up to the heart-lung system where the blood is purified and oxygen is added and it makes a, a, a rich blood. Now. If we were using our global economics model, then the heart would say, as a distribution center, the body price for blood is so much today, who wants, and then you sell it uh, to the rest of the body. And some of the organs, maybe some of the bones even, that contributed the raw materials would not be able to afford it. And so it's very clear that we can't live in a capitalist economy in our own bodies. Uh, what do we do with that when we know that this was good for expanding the economy and we all grew to a certain size before we leveled off, now we have to shift into a different kind of economy. And the best models I know in the world uh, are neither communist nor capitalist, but they are living economies that mimic nature much more closely than anything we have done so far um, in, our, in our larger societies. And I could talk about a few of those role models, if you like. Oh. Well, now or later, how much of this is just remembering who we are, and how much is inventing something completely new that we sort of have okay. to uh, invent ourselves? The role of, of evolution biology, I think, is to show us the long trajectory of the past in which nature learned again and again what it means to move from expansive creative societies into sustainably creative societies. And so uh, there's, a po there's a point in helping humans remember the biological past. We also have to recognize that, in my view of things, that we are spirit having a human experience and that we are here to ground cosmic love in our societies. And I think possibly the reason why democracy has not worked as well as, as we had hoped it would work is because we cut ourselves off from our spiritual interconnections. And I mean, we're even biologically, we breathe each other's cells all the time and we breathe in bits of DNA from other species and, and our body knows which ones it might want to keep and which ones it rejects. And our guts are full of uh, bacteria that are not within our cells as descendants of the ancient bacteria, but, but occupy our guts to the tune of about one quadrillion of them. And the newest information is that they run 85% of our immune systems. So we had better watch what we eat, what we feed them, because they are the ones keeping us healthy. And we have to stop seeing bacteria just as disease germs 
because it's a tiny percentage of them that are uh, causing problems and the huge majority of them are, are we couldn't live without. They digest our food and run our immune system, do all kinds of wonderful things for us. So if you recognize all nature as intelligent, as spirit materialized, then you start to see that our job here is, as I say, to ground cosmic love, which means that we will care and share for each other, which means in biological terms that we discover that it takes less energy to make friends than to maintain enmity. Now, because we're at the end of the empire building phase for humanity, which is an adolescence, um, we, we can see that there was a point in, ha in going through adolescence. You, you n will never get mature cooperative citizens if they don't go through adolescence first. And you don't step on caterpillars if you want butterflies. You know, these transformations are natural. And if we combine evolution, uh, the stories of evolution, with our understanding of ourselves as cosmic spiritual beings, and we see that the maturation process always has to occur again and again, then we can s begin to see how we do it. And we are doing it now because we have more than a million NGOs, for instance, in the world, most of which are, are feeding people locally or cleaning rivers or connecting people with each other, building echo villages. All of these things are cooperative ventures. And even at the larger size scale, we have the United Nations as a cooperative venture. We have international space stations. We have world parliaments of religions. I'm crusading for world, uh, a world consortium of sciences that can talk to each other across very different beliefs about what kind of a universe we're in. How do you see, for instance, an adolescent society full of competition mm -hmm. Another society that is, let's say, poor in one of the mm -hmm. poor countries, so the cells are actually not yet fine-tuned and not, they are right. very different. They're in the adolescent phase, and when we, yes. when we recognize that, uh, we said adolescence is about individualism and competition, mm -hmm. right, and, and expansion and creatively expanding. And, East Europe, of course, suffered a great deal from the Thatcher-Reagan privatization of the world kind of economics, where the word restructuring just sends my hair on end, too, because it means privatizing uh, countries that were communist countries. And you see, communism sacrificed the, the motivation of the individual by focusing on what you can give to the larger collective, right? And capitalism sacrifices community to individual gain, to greed, mm -hmm. to personal greed. So we have this, these strange things that come and go in waves in our society where China, for instance, was very focused on trying to build socialism, communism, just when the capitalist West came in and taught it to do you know, the feeding frenzy of competition. I spoke to one lady who trains MBA students in China, and she said in eight years, the, the co country was shifted from young people serving their society to young people wanting to climb the corporate ladder at elbowing everybody else out of the way to do it. So we, this is, we, we moved from what maybe potentially could have been a mature mode, but we weren't ready for it. So communism collapsed first by denying individual interest. In the body, every cell meets its individual interest, and every organ does as well. And so you have constant negotiations between the individual and the community for the well-being of the whole. But and you until you reach that stage, yes. what do you do as, let's say, yes. individual? Because right. in Romania, it's lots of yes. competition, the young people, yes. the other ones. How Tell them, the, tell them the story of evolution in which again and again species go through this necessary juvenile competitive phase in order to reach maturity. Don't we expect every one of those young people in Romania to end up as cooperative community citizens by the time they're 40? Well, younger people yeah. are more cooperative and there is lots of entrepreneurship mm -hmm. and really serving the That's issue which we sign. see is yeah. with the generation over 40. So well, part I of the older yeah. cells yeah. with some new intermediate cells and the young ones are 
trying very hard. Focus on the young ones because they are here to okay. bring the new mature stage. And I like to say to children, you have to help the grown-ups grow up now. Mm. I mean, we okay. all, all over the world, teach our children, don't hit each other, don't take things from each other, don't <laughs> call each other names, right? And then yes. they turn on the television set, what are the grown-ups doing? Calling each other names, taking things away from each other, hitting each other, right? So the, the children know that we're hypocrites that what we teach them isn't what the grown-ups are actually doing. So I like to say to audiences, what shall we do? Stop teaching children these things or start practicing these things ourselves? Mm -hmm.